Um, my name is Elizabeth Pickett. I'm one of two co-executive directors at Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. And we have uh, Nani Barreto, the other executive director, and uh, Devin Aruda on the call today too, also at, with Hawaii Wildfire. And together we're gonna to be sharing some tips and tricks that you can use to prepare your families and your properties from wildfire. So I wanna thank you ahead of time uh, for spending this hour with us. It's really important work that we are all engaging in together. I did wanna start off really quickly with a little bit of information about our organization. We are a nonprofit organization. We've been serving the state and um, more recently across the Western Pacific and lots of things related to wildfire. We've So we've been around for more than 20 years and we started off on Hawaii Island, but sp spread over time to become a hub of wildfire information, planning, risk reduction activities, and fire science communication. So we work in close partnership with our fire and forestry agency partners and community partners and the university, um, all in order to collectively work toward increasing wildfire awareness and preparedness and ultimately resilience uh, for our people and places. Um, before we launch into all of the lessons and information for today, we wanted to give you the takeaways um, up front. So if nothing else, this is what we want you to leave here knowing today. Uh, we really want to point out that Hawaii is a fire-prone state. We are on par with the most fire-prone states in the country. 99% of our fires are caused by humans and human activities, mostly by accident, which for us, we find very hopeful because it means we can prevent them uh, with better and more informed, careful behaviors. And we also want you to know there's a role for everyone to play when it comes to wildfire. It's really going to take all of us, each of us doing our different parts to keep our people and our landscapes fire safe. Um, firefighting is the last line of defense. We've had to debunk that myth quite a bit. Um, not all things fire are the fire department's responsibility. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff that we need to do ahead of time, individually and collectively. And being proactive is really important. So a lot of uh, programs and other kinds of support exist for communities who want to do their wildfire preparedness work uh, ahead of time and do their part and be proactive. And we're gonna cover that at the end of today's presentation. So with that, um, we do wanna start off this webinar with some foundational information about wildfires in Hawaii. And ultimately they've been increasing for several decades. And what we see related to wildfire occurrence in any place really is a combination or a result of what's happening with human activities, with climate and with things that are combustible and we call those fuels. So in Hawaii, we have the recipe for increasing wildfires. We have increasing uh, human caused ignitions. We have a, a cycle of heavy rains and heavy greenups of our vegetation, followed by dry periods and episodes of drought that then dry everything out. And we have um, we have non-native fire-prone vegetation and highly combustible homes and towns. So to better understand all the parts and pieces of what's happening with wildfire and where we might be able to reduce risk and mitigate, um, we've developed this quick and easy way to talk about the story um, in a very basic form. So ultimately, Hawaii and Pacific Islands are burning, and it's because of those human-caused ignitions. And in Hawaii, that ends up being campfires, cooking fires, equipment, everything from um, utilities to mowers and welders, things like that, um, vehicles from um, car accidents and just driving on dry grass. Uh, are known to start wildfires in Hawaii and also fireworks. So we have these ignitions. Those create sparks or ignite fires that spread across unmanaged fire-prone vegetation. And when all the conditions are right, they really can threaten lives and homes and ignite the built environment. And so there is no one single answer or one single um, action that we need to take. It has to be a comprehensive picture that addresses all all parts of this equation. So we're gonna talk about that built environment part today. 
we're going to be diving into that pretty significantly and talk about how to reduce risk around the homes and neighborhoods so that they reduce ignition. Um, but we do have this map right here of wildfire ignitions. We were able to track and record locations for fires that took place over a 20 year span. And we learned a lot of things by creating this database and these maps. And we want to point out some of those things that we learned. Um, we did this by collecting all of our fire agencies records and then mapping those fires. So the first thing to note is that fires are being ignited on both windward and leeward sides. Um, on every single island in, in the state, every dot on the map is a fire that required a fire suppression response by our fire agencies. Um, the dots represent each fire, not the total areas burned. It just re re, um, reports the ignition location. We do have those larger sea green shapes that show some of the larger acreage burn scars as well. But from this effort, we learned that Wildfires are frequently larger on leeward sides, mostly because those areas are drier with large acreage of combustible fuels, but under dry conditions, really anywhere can burn. So this is um, an all sides, all islands kind of issue because you need both ignitions and burnable fuel to have wildfires. And we've started to see, you know, we have ignitions and fuel everywhere in the state. So at this point, the greatest factor influencing wildfire risk is how dry the vegetation is at any given point in time um, per area and, and um, what's going on with the wind. So before we dive into the ready, set, go preparedness, you know, more formal information, we wanna emphasize the idea that it does take everyone to protect our lands, our waters and our people from wildfire. I mean, firefighters actually do a really good job of putting out our fires, but um, I'll stress it again that everybody needs to help prevent accidental fires. We can't accidentally light fires um, and, and cause sparks. That's the first of all of this. But then the rest is that there's a lot we need to do to manage our vegetation, to, um, do, to address combustibility of our building materials and our homes and our, um, we have to maintain our yards and we have to work around our neighborhoods to, so that they all better resist being ignited and so that any fires that do come close um, and pose any threats that we're ready to evacuate early and we have everything in place and ready well in advance. So the good news is that unlike other hazards like a flood or a hurricane or something where you have no control, you have actually a lot of say over fire behavior because fire can only travel where there's fuel. And fuel is something that we can do a lot about because we can manage vegetation, we can reduce the flammability of um, the types of, by, by replacing combustible building materials with less combustible or non-combustible building materials. So we just want to remind you that throughout this whole thing, um, we want it to be empowering and we want to remind you that you get the most safety and protection when you take proactive actions well in advance of the fire. And really, you're already doing that today by joining us. So we're so thankful for that. And in this workshop, you're going to learn more detailed strategies than just these bigger picture concepts. Um, and we're going to provide you with lots of tips on the proactive actions you can already get started on you know, as soon as possible. Um, and we're, we will be following the details and the principles that are set forth in the Hawaii specific version of the National Ready, Set, Go program. So from here, I'm going to hand it off to Nani, our other director, and she's going to get started with that deep dive into all the Ready, Set, Go details. And we'll hand it off between us uh, to try to keep it interesting. So that's, that's all you, Nani. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and good evening, everybody. There on the screen is the picture of the Ready, Set, Go handbook. And at some point tonight, we'll drop the link where you can download that handbook. Like Elizabeth said, tonight you are going to learn about some simple and, and easy steps that you can do now ahead of fire season, really to increase your home survivability, that's the ready portion, to have situ situational awareness when a fire starts, that's the set, and then tips to evacuate early, the go portion. Um, please note that all of these recommendations are rooted in principles based on really solid fire science research into how homes ignite. The data, the observations, they come from experiments and models using what was learned during some of the country's worst wildland fire disasters. Also know that we opted to use photos and examples not from our recent fires. You know, it's important to us that we show preparedness strategies for 
for educational purposes and as sensitive of manner as possible. Our hope today is that you put into practice some of the tips and recommendations you learn. And if you do, do know that you're maximizing your chances for safety for your home, your yard, and most importantly, your family and neighbors. So first up is that ready portion of the ready, set, go. You will notice that the ready is the longest portion of today's presentation. Being ready means three things here on the screen. Creating defensible space around your home, hardening your home, and making and practicing an evacuation plan. So first we're gonna talk about that, the defensible space. The primary goal for defensible space is fields reduction, you know, limiting the level of flammable vegetation and material surrounding the home. Again, um, like Elizabeth said, now's the time to do it. We have to do it ahead of time, not when there's smoke in the air, not when you get the evacuation alert. The best time to do it is all year long and really to do it as part of your regular housekeeping, your regular yard work. We as homeowners, we have to take primary responsibility for wildfire safety around our homes. So looking at this photo um, or these two photos, a prepared home, let me, let me mention a bit more about defensible space. So a prepared home means a defendable one. That's where the term defensible space comes from. Firefighters are absolutely awesome at what they do. They are trained to safely, efficiently suppress wildland fires, but there will never be enough resources to protect every home during a severe event. And even if it's just one home, they can't defend it if they have to sweep the decks, move the wood piles, move the patio furniture while trying to fight it. And they definitely don't wanna feel like their life is in danger to protect our home. So let's look at these two pictures and think about what differences you might see. The one on the left survived a wildfire event. The one on the right did not. On the left right away, you can probably see all the green vegetation. You might notice that the grass is short and hydrated. There's not a lot of dead vegetation around. There's no debris piles. The trees are spaced far apart. They're located further away from that house. Even the driveway there in the back, there looks to be plenty of clearance for a fire truck. And then that picture on the right, I know it's hard to see, um, but what you're looking at, those gray areas, those are ash. Those are remnants of three different houses that were, weren't able to be defended. They couldn't resist what probably started as an ember storm. You can see um, you know, all that vegetation, how overgrown and unmanaged it looks. Probably lots of vegetation too close to the house. Maybe the home was unreachable, unsafe for firefighters. Probably a combination of all of those things. Defensible space makes a difference. And according to fire science research, it's not where a home is located that necessarily determines the ignition risk. It's the landscape around it, the defensible space, sometimes referred to as the home ignition zone. With that said, I wanna show you the three ways that structures can ignite. It might be different than what you think. First, structures or, or any fuel can ignite through direct contact with flames. Second, they can ignite from embers, sometimes referred to as firebrands. Or third, they can ignite from radiant heat, which is when air gets superheated from a fire source and then comes into contact with something that has lower heat tolerance. In Hawaii, the primary way wildfire spread into the built environment is through ember and ember storms. Um, embers are those burning bits and pieces of vegetation. In our winds, they can carry them long distances through the air. So we need our homes and our yards to be able to, be able to resist those embers, which means we need to remove any chance that an ember could land somewhere on our property, smolder, and then ignite other nearby combustible debris. For example, the dry leaf pile that might be in our rain gutter or maybe underneath our lanai decks, even the dog bed sitting outside our back door. By the way, it's not uncommon for me to hear people saying that only the houses that are on the edge of a neighborhood and closer to the wildland areas are at risk of structure ignitions. This is not true. And I hope you understand now that it doesn't matter where your house is located. On a windy day, a distant wildfire can produce embers that can fly anywhere, long distances, including on top of that one leaf pile 
that's sitting under that one nook of that one neighbor's eaves that happens to be in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, the good news though is that science tells us that there's a lot we can do in and around our homes to increase the chances of our home surviving an event like this. Okay, move, continuing on with defensible space, reminder that's the buffer you create between a structure on your property and its surrounding vegetation. This buffer is needed so that a fire that's crawling along the ground towards your home can either slow down or completely stop and keep your home protected. We also refer to defensible space as home ignition zone. And the concept here is that home materials and the immediate surroundings dictate its ignitability. Best practices is to start closest to the structure and work your way out. That is where your mitigation actions are going to have the most impact. So the home ignition zone is broken up into three zones. The first zone closest to the house is the zero to five foot zone there in the red. That includes the structure itself and the first zero to five feet from your home. We also call this the non-combustible zone. So for this area, we really wanna keep everything there completely free of combustible materials, at least as much as we can, so that in the event of a windblown ember reaching this area, there won't be materials to burn. Or even if there's a little bit of combustible material, it's not enough to sustain that flame for long. That next zone is the intermediate zone, which is five to 30 feet from your structure. We also like to call this the clean, lean, clean, and green zone. So we want the vegetation in this zone to be lean or very minimal, spaced apart, both horizontally and vertically. We want the vegetation to be clean, that's having removed all the dead and dying vegetation and debris, and green, making sure the vegetation that is there is drought tolerant, looks healthy, green, that sort of thing. And then that third zone moving away from the house is the 30 to 100 foot zone. Plants in this zone should be low growing, well irrigated and less flammable. That way they can reduce the speed and the intensity in the event of an approaching fire. By the way, it's not uncommon to have neighbors whose home ignition zones overlap yours. That means neighbors will need to work together to address their shared risks. If you notice vegetation in your yard is part of their home ignition zone, please be a good neighbor, mitigate that risk as soon as you can. This will protect, protect you from fires coming from their side and it will protect them as well. So it, please, as you start prepping your yard, think about these zones as you do your yard work. Focus first your time and your energy within that first zone closest to the heart, to the home, the zero to five foot zone, including the house itself. The biggest bang for your buck in terms of keeping your house protected will come from whatever you can do in this zone. And then after you've done the work there, you can continue working away from the house as your time and energy permits. And finally, think through any actions you might need to take on your parameter so that there's greater safety for your neighbors as well. Finally, some practical tips. Let's start with the zero to five foot zone. The main thing here is to remove all combustible or flammable materials or replace them with non-combustible ones. That's the main thing. Start by getting rid of all the dead and dying debris from the structure. Look at your roofs, your gutters, your lanai, your porches, your stairways, even underneath the posts. And then do the same in the first five feet around your house. Look for the dead and dying weeds, the plants, the shrubs, the trees, branches. Keep your lawn mowed short in that area. And then keep doing this sort of work throughout the season as things are drying up. Um, it's really all about maintenance year round, maintenance, maintenance. Also, if you have a propane tank nearby, create a buffer around it too. get rid of any vegetation that might burn. Another tip is not to use combustible materials like bark, wood chips, or mulch. Instead use hardscape like gravel, papers, concrete, that sort of thing. Plants within this zone really should be limited to those that grow low to the ground. Don't have a lot of woody materials. Keep things that can be easily watered and maintained. This kind of landscaping is 
considered zero scaped landscapes because the plants need little, sometimes no water beyond what the natural climate already provides, which makes it fire resistant. Try to limit combustible items on top of decks and lanai's, things like outdoor furniture, planters, there have been house fires that started because an ember would land on outdoor furniture that was combustible. You can also reduce the ignition potential by moving any lumber or other combustible materials away from the house. Final practical tip for this first zone is to replace any fencing, gates, and arbors that are made from wood materials and that are attached to the home with non-combustible alternatives. Things like fire-resistant vinyl, rock, metal. You might also want to consider relocating your garbage or recycling containers if they're housed inside this zone, um, because you know these these kind of receptacles can also create little nooks for ember gathering. Always remember, anywhere where anywhere wind blows leaves, it can blow embers. Moving on to our second zone. This is the zone that is five to 30 feet from your house. Again, we're thinking lean, clean, green. Plants and trees should be minimal here, spread apart. Again, all the dead brown dying parts should be removed. Plants need to look green, healthy. They should be the type that can handle dry conditions um, or at least need minimal watering. Be sure to remove branches that hang over the roof. Um, these could potentially catch your roof on fire. Remove or prune any flammable plants and shrubs. Keep those fuel loads down. Regarding the grass, best to keep it mowed to a maximum height of four inches. It will reduce the potential of fire spreading along the ground. It could even stop the fire in its tracks. Side note on that though, don't forget, you don't want your mower to be an ignition source. So, Try avoiding mowing during the hottest times of the day or on a super windy day. Um, keep the equipment in good shape. We don't want any sparks. For keeping, let's see, I think we, did we skip a slide? For keeping, okay, yeah, this is still five, five to 30. For keeping vegetation lean, the goal here is to reduce what we call ladder fuels. Ladder fuels are vegetation that can carry a fire that burns in a low, gr low growing vegetative area to nearby taller vegetation. Examples include things like low lying tree branches or shrubs and trees under a canopy of a larger tree. This is also the zone where you wanna think about replacing any dry fire prone plants with more fire resistant plants. Sometimes we call these plants firewise plants because they're less likely to ignite from embers. Um, they're often native. Native plants are already adapted to this climate. They're, they tend to be drought tolerant. They usually produce minimal leaf litter. litter. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. She dropped a link in the chat if you want to download a, a bookmark that has a list of firewise plants on it. The last practical tip for this zone is to make sure your home is accessible by the fire service. That means driveways and roads need a clearance of at least 14 feet wide and 14 feet tall. You also want to make sure your address is visible so the fire department can locate your house. Um, you know, oftentimes this idea of accessibility is overlooked. So just remember to think about that as you're thinking through your preparedness plan. So that concludes the yard work portion. Um, now returning back to the zero to five foot zone where the actual structure is located, home hardening. Um, homes that are hardened are just less likely to ignite, period. Home hardening includes non-flammable construction materials and a resistant building design. So let's start with a definition. Home hardening, home hardening addresses the most vulnerable components of your house with building materials and installation techniques that increase resistance to heat, flames, and embers. It's a very important aspect of your home's survivability during a wildfire. Any openings, areas where combustible debris accumulates or where embers can get into your home, it can result in a structure fire that starts from the inside out. So going back to our Ready, Set, Go handbook, on the right-hand side, that's, the, that's actually the centerfold of the 20-page Ready, Set, Go handbook. 
And it walks you through every aspect of the housing materials and installation procedures for how your house can be hardened and better protected. It is, remember, it is important to remember that home hardening requires you to think about really anywhere embers could possibly get into your house. Think about the gaps, the cracks, the uncovered vents, anywhere leaf litter and other debris might accumulate. We usually see the homes ignite when embers get into those little crevices and into the house. Home hardening can be done during the original build, which is obviously preferred, but it can also be done as a retrofit later on. Every little thing you do, every replacement reduces risk and helps a home withstand wildfire. So some tips for hardening are here. Um, I always start with roofs and I actually don't see it on the screen, but um, they are the most vulnerable surface because embers can land and get lodged and then start a fire. Roof and material that's fire resistant and will help keep the flame from spreading is what you want to go for. Things like composition shingle, metal, clay, cement tile, all of these are good options. Um, gutters, they can serve as points of entry. So think about installing gutter guards or screens. Um, open eaves, embers can gather under them and ignite exposed wood or other combustible things. So making sure to close those open eaves with metal screens or maybe consider box eaves from the start. Um, attics, embers can enter attics or other concealed spaces. So vents and eaves are particularly vulnerable. Um, try screening vent openings with 1 8 inch metal screens. Um, fencing, we talked a bit about that already. Um, fencing that is combustible can become engulfed and if attached to the home sidings, it can carry the fire right to the home like a wick. So we always encourage people to consider separating the fence from the house with some sort of metal or other um, non-combustible barrier. Um, and then the windows, dead or dry plants near windows can be ignited from embers and generate heat that can break windows or even the, the, the melt the frame. So try to remove vegetation that's around or under the windows. Um, here's a diagram example of parts of the house to think about when hardening your home. Um, the left side has building materials and installation techniques that are not ember resistant, the red. Um, and then the right side shows building materials and installation techniques that harden the home and increase its survivability. For example, um, eaves, you're going for the closed ones, not the open. Siding, consider the fiber cement board versus wood shingles. For windows, we've got the tool, dual pane tempered including screens where you don't want single pane, no screens. Um, consider rock as mulch um, instead of um, wood chips. Um, and remember your decks. Um, instead of redwood with the standard spacing, consider something that has less spacing. Okay, this is a video. We're gonna play it briefly for you. It's a video of a house being attacked by a simulated ember storm. This is in a laboratory setting. What I want you to notice are two sides of the structure. The right side is hardened and has a five foot non-combustible buffer. And then the left side is, is not hardened and you can see there's flammable debris within that first five feet. So go ahead and play it, Devin. So here's the, the house. Again, this is in a laboratory setting. They have a lot of, it's a simulated intense ember storm that's happening. Left side has that debris caught fire pretty quickly engulfed the home. And next it's gonna show the right-hand side that stayed clear of ignition, hardened, no combustibles in that first five foot. So that concludes the ready set portion or the uh, part of the ready portion. I can't stress enough that home hardening and defensible space, it really does increase the odds of a house surviving a wildfire. And it's all based on sound fire science. So with that, we want to challenge you right now, this weekend, this month to take action. We are holding a raffle. Everybody here is eligible to play. And if you're watching this, um, 
on a recording, you are also eligible. Devin's going to put a, a, a link in the chat box with a checklist of actions we talked about today that you can take to get prepared. So we want you to let us know what actions you took, send us a picture, and you might win a cool Hawaii wildfire wildfire preparedness t-shirt. Um, we'll we'll pick pick names after um, in, in early June. The third piece of being ready, remember we're systematically walking you through the contents of the Ready, Set, Go handbook, is all about evacuation planning. So you guys have heard enough about me. I'm gonna hand it off to Elizabeth um, and, and she'll take it from here. Okay, thanks, Sunny. And first, I want to um, sort of verbally acknowledge that uh, we've been let know that the chat box it has for some reason been disabled. So uh, we'll work on that on our end. Um, but yes, thanks, Nani, for all of that. That uh, the ready part of things is really important, and we have one last piece of it. So uh, evacuation planning is the last piece of being ready. And this includes writing out your plan um, and also remembering to update it yearly because things change, um, contact numbers change, et cetera. And so you also want to um, not only develop it and update it, but each time you have an update, you want to practice it. So that means grabbing your go bag and leaving the house, practice your evacuation routes well in advance of having to do it in a fire event. Um, so when we say go grab your go bags, that means they should be packed ahead of time and placed in a convenient location all year long. And um, remember that evacuations are stressful. It might be smoky. You might have to change routes. And so those are all the kinds of things that you want to have simulated and thought through and kind of practiced ahead of time. Um, so a piece of that is making sure that your whole family is involved and that everyone is aware of what's going to happen and some of the alternatives in case of a wildfire event. And practicing ahead of time is super important um, in terms of being prepared so that you've done it before, it's not the first time, you're not figuring things out as you go. And then we're gonna talk a lot as we go and we're gonna emphasize over and over again that we want you to be ready to evacuate as early as possible, um, even before you've been told to. And uh, a lot of times your safety and um, uh, depends on it. Your safety depends on it. And also there's a lot more to benefits of evacuating early for the whole entire fire event and for your community. So um, we wanna think through also that helping others that, um, uh, helping you if you don't already have an evacuation plan and you need a template, we want you to know that there are templates inside of the Ready, Set, Go uh, preparedness guide that you and your family can easily use so that your evacuation plan is in writing, um, it's on paper, uh, after thinking it through and, and noting all of your information, it's good to practice it and to keep that plan somewhere handy, somewhere accessible. Um, maybe taped on your safe or on your refrigerator or even inside or on top of connected to your go bag, places like that. Mainly somewhere that's super obvious, it's easily accessible, maybe somewhere where you see it all the time and you can't help but be aware of what it says, somewhere you will remember. Um, so uh, once you've made it, here, when it, when it comes to practicing it, we um, we want you to add in a few factors. So remember to consider any vulnerable neighborhood uh, neighbors in your planning efforts and in your practicing, um, and or and or helping them develop their own plan, um, especially if some extra assistance is going to be needed for them in evacuating. Not everyone has the capacity to evacuate on their own. So thinking through who might need some extra help in preparing or in evacuating like a Puna or folks who have mobility or transportation challenges, um, that's all important. And also in addition to friends and neighbors who need it, um, remember to include your pets and your animals in your evacuation plan um, and have a plan for how you're gonna get them out and what you'll carry them in, how you'll transport them, food, water, et cetera. So, um, there's, a, there's a section related to supplies that you should have on hand and some information on how to assemble your go bag. And we want you to have that. It's in the Ready, Set, Go bag. It's also, um, you can access that very easily through the American Red Cross. And 
we can't emphasize, we've said it probably every slide, the last five slides, you can't practice and prepare enough. Um, basically, you might find something on your written plan doesn't work. You might uh, want to have a chance to revise it ahead of time. Um, at the last minute is not the time to be having to rethink everything. And once you've done all that, you can sort of rest easy and feel good that you prepared as well as you could in advance of any uh, fire incidents. So that is the, um, the ready portion and complete. So we talked about defensible space, we talked about home gardening, and now we've talked about preparing and practicing your evacuation plan. So I think we're ready to head to set. I think that's the next slide. Yes. So the question here is, what is set? How can we be set? And really what that means is maintaining situational awareness, which is really just kind of lingo for paying attention and knowing what's going on. So um, there's a lot of indications if you look around you to let you know when the fire hazard is increasing or getting high. And that takes paying attention in two ways. So the first way is really um, seasonally. So throughout the year, you can watch for when the grass is drying out, you can pay attention to the color and the condition of vegetation. You'll notice, I mean, we've all seen it, green grass turns yellow and then brown and then gray. Um, let that be the beginning of those changes in color and in hydration and aliveness to be an indication to you that we're entering into a dry period, that fire hazard is increasing and allow it to sort of hustle you into taking the preparedness actions that we've gone over earlier if you haven't already. Really, we like to say this is a year round issue, year round maintenance. Um, things can dry out rapidly any time of the year. Um, but that's where paying attention throughout the seasons and throughout the year really come into effect. Um, the second way of being aware and having situational awareness is when there is a nearby fire event occurring in your general vicinity. So during a fire and throughout the day, um, we all know winds change direction. They speed up, slow down, back off. There's um, Wind is very dynamic. So please just don't assume that because of a fire, because a fire is far away and it looks like the smoke is blowing the fire, the wind is blowing the smoke and the fire away from you that you're in the clear. Um, we have lots of occasions where the fire behavior will change directions because the wind has changed direction. So it doesn't, what you see at one moment is not how it will remain. So we just want you to stay vigilant and aware and pay attention and, um, know that things can change pretty fast. So be observant, track it with your own senses, watch it, look at it, smell. I mean, use your sense of smell, your sense of sight, even that spiny sense inside that kind of feels weird. Um, pay attention to your intuition and really look, be, be really vigilant in tracking it with your own senses and through formal trusted sources of emergency notifications. Um, all of that together will help you and your family be safe. Um, in the event of a nearby fire. So we wanted to take you back to what Nani was sharing with you in the beginning when she talked about the different ways that fire spreads. So remember that not fires don't only spread through direct flame contact, but also from superheated air and from embers that float and land wherever, sometimes miles away from where they originated, originated and they can land on all kinds of debris. Like she said, roof gutters, green waste piles, all the little nooks and crannies in your home or on your roof and and really um they can enter through windows and through vents and other things and ignite something inside and burn your house from the inside out and so we just want you to be aware of all those different ways that fire behaves um so that you know what to be paying attention to and what to be aware of and um we say this not so that you live in this constant state of fear or panic. That's not the idea here. This is just really to give you kind of what we call like the fire lenses. So you really understand what you're working with and how to be safest um, for, with all the considerations. So you can just pay attention to your own sense of things and use your own critical thinking and your own informed sense of how fire works to track what's going on. So the last section here is go. And this part, Actually, we said we had all those takeaways for you, but this is another huge takeaway that we want you to leave here with. So actually, if you forget everything else, this is really a big deal. Um, are you ready to go and are you ready to go early? I mean, the idea is you need to be ready ahead of time, your house, your home, your yard, your plan, you've been paying attention. 
So plan to leave early and to take your go bag with you. That's already ready to go in an easy place. Um, so when you are planning and writing your evacuation plan, uh, you do, like I said before, um, you wanna have several travel routes planned out. Um, think through how you'll navigate closed roads or traffic. Um, a lot of neighborhoods have only one way in and out. This is also an advantage of leaving early so you can sort that out um, and as you go. And along with having that pre-planned route, um, plan out where you're going to go to. So um, you might have an evacuation shelter option, uh, which you would be notified of during any event. Um, but if you're leaving early and that information hasn't come out yet, you might want to decide to go to somewhere low risk. Um, just get out of Dodge. You can go to a friend's house, go to the beach, you can go to dinner, you can do whatever. And just get out so that you're not in the vicinity and fighting evacuation traffic. So um, we, we, strongly encourage you to have several options in place, including a motel or whatever makes sense, something, some, some place that you can go um, and a place to consider you can go and stay the night if needed. So um, make sure that you are also staying alert to the formal communications and any evacuation orders that are issued and do follow those directives. Um, they're given to you by emergency managers and all the people coordinating um, the safest exit and shelter plans given the situation. If you've left early, that information might not be available, but it will be if it's needed. Um, so we really encourage you to sign up for your county's emergency management or civil defense agency alerts. Um, those are the agencies that coordinate and issue those directives and provide all that information and open up shelters, et cetera. So we're gonna put a link if it isn't already there in the chat box so that you can sign up today for emergency notifications. And um, remember use your intuition and use this training and others and reliable information at the time to know what's going on and to to make your best judgment of what to do. So um, the important part though is really about leaving early ahead of time. There aren't um, there aren't the resources to personally help every single person pack their bag and escort them out of their house. We just don't have that kind of personnel in this state to do that. So having everything ready and using your own sense of responsibility um, and urgency is gonna be really helpful. So um, to end this go portion of the Ready, Set, Go program, we want to give you a video of a driver who documented their escape with, and probably too late from an ember storm. Again, we're not using Hawaii videos. Um, we want to be sensitive and it's hard enough to watch this, um, but we want you to note a few things. So we're going to we're going to play the video. OK, so while you're watching this, notice the smoke. Keep in mind that this is important that every, even while cars are moving really slowly, everybody's minds or hearts are racing, people are scared. Um, and oftentimes that can lead to medical incidents on top of the traffic and on top of the fire that um, adds to the danger and the, the complication of the situation. So in part, that um, is exactly why it's really hard to it's a complex decision by our agencies to decide on mandatory evacuation because there are additional medical uh, situations that come up on top of the um, all the other incidents and things that they're managing. But leaving early helps you avoid this traffic. It helps you know protect your family, and then. Um, it's just better for everyone to evacuate early when you do that when you leave early when you don't uh, contribute to that evacuation traffic. What you're also doing is contributing to swifter response and clearer roads for everyone else to evacuate because keeping the roads clear as possible for emergency responders to get in is another thing. It's not just people getting out, but we want to enable and make safe it, make it safe for our firefighters to get in. Um, and we want you to do that before all the stressors pile up and the cars evacuating pile up and then you start to have limited options. So um, I started to say this earlier, but essentially, you, if you've been paying attention all season and then all day or what at night during an incident and you're ready and you've been using situational awareness to track what's happening, 
you can use your own judgment to leave early um, and you can do it way before anybody tells you that it's required. And then you can go, I always say with the peace of knowing that you and your home and family are as protected as possible that you could have done um, because you did all that preparedness work ahead of time. You made your home and yard ignition resistant. You planned it out. You did your best and you had all these tools and that's what we're trying to provide you with today. So um, I said it probably 10 times, but the point is just leave early. Just, just go. Um, and so with that, I think that might be my last slide for this portion, for the Ready, Set, Go portion of the program. And it coincides precisely with the more detailed information that's within the Ready, Set, Go Preparedness Guide. Um, we are gonna put that in the chat box as well. We also have it available on our website. Um, and I wanna take a minute to summarize what we've covered today. So we're challenging you again to take action around these principles. And we want you to ha have your yard ready with defensible space. We want your home to be guarded with non-combustible building materials. Your family should be prepared well in advance with your evacuation plan, not only developed, but practiced and updated annually. Um, don't forget to remember your neighbors and your pets. And then we want you to be set all year long, stay alert throughout the year. Notice when things are getting dry, notice when the seasons are changing and fire risk is increasing and stay super alert and tuned in and informed, paying attention during any incidents or fire events that are occurring. And then finally go, leave early, um, if at all possible. So if you follow those recommendations, you at least have that comfort of knowing you've done all you can. And um, we have this, all these materials and information available digitally. Paper copies are also available if you would like to request them. Um, and we also invite you to request them in bulk if you have an opportunity to distribute them more widely within your neighborhoods or your social networks. Um, we're going to post that information in the chat box, and you can also go to the hawaiiwildfire.org website. So with that, I think I'll hand it off to Nani to sort of close us out and um, finish up with the rest of this information. Great. Okay, so additional resources before you leave the webinar. The Ready, Set, Go Handbook, it's not our only resource for learning about wildfire preparedness. As Elizabeth said, our website, hawaiiwildfire.org, is chock full of information. We also have our FireWise Communities Program that supports nationally recognized FireWise neighborhoods across the state that are taking action at their local levels to address wildfire safety. Um, that link is in the chat. Being part of that program is also a great way to meet neighbors, get organized, take, act, take action, and really build that resilience into our neighborhoods. Secondly, I want to make sure everybody's aware that May is National Community Wildfire Preparedness Month. There's a lot of planning going on right now, and this webinar is being offered to um, a lot of residents throughout the state that are part of FireWise neighborhoods, and their participation in this webinar actually contributes to them maintaining their national FireWise recognition. Um, but we also have dozens of neighborhoods that are doing community mitigation projects throughout the month of May. Um, so if you're part of a FireWise community, we encourage you to get out and participate in your community's wildfire preparedness events. And lastly, all of our agencies and our partner organizations across the state, we promote together an annual wildfire information campaign called Wildfire and Drought Lookout. The goal of this campaign is to bring awareness and information to all of you, to the general public, using the same messaging. Why Wildfire, we host the campaign website. Please um, visit it. You can find campaign materials, including the, the Ready, Set, Go handbook. To, you can also sign up for emergency alerts and, and find other resources. And Nani, I dropped those in the chat. You'll see, we can laugh because I added extra words in there accidentally, but um, that both of those links are in there in the chat. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, of course, we also have our our um, our social media. Please follow it. We've been posting, and we're going to post more throughout May for Community Preparedness Month. Subscribe to our Hawaii Wildfire newsletters. That way, you can stay up to date on the latest and greatest. Um, we put out wildfire related news, tools, opportunities like this where you can continue to learn um, in other communications. 
So lastly, I just want to thank each of you for being part of this annual event. We really are so grateful to everybody for, for their partnership in this work with us. Um, so many of you have reached out in the past eight months looking for ways to join the cause, to get prepared, to do it right. Um, we are really honored to be able to support you in your efforts. 